we're surrounded. Men of faith who've learned the art of perseverance. We're surrounded. Women of courage who know what it means to face their fear and how it feels to get knocked down, but to now hold their crown of victory. So let's run this race until this race is done. Let's run this race until this race is won. We're running with giants. Hey, good morning, Rundle Christian Church. Yeah, what a blessing to see all of you this morning. You know, one of my uh, my favorite things to do every once in a while is to to pause from an opportunity to hang out on this stage and instead uh, hang out with with you all for for a Sunday and just sit under some excellent teaching this morning. Uh, and that's what we're going to do this morning. I, I'm really excited because we have uh, within our own congregation a, a brother in Christ, a great friend a fellow bond servant who's going to be taking us into our next lesson uh, as we're talking about running with giants. So would you do me a big favor and help me welcome to the stage my brother in Christ, Zach Gibson. Love you, man. Good morning. How you guys doing? Man, I'm stoked to be here with you guys this morning. Before I jump in, though, before we get into running with the Giants, I just want to take a second and tell you guys that uh, we love you guys. And um, Christy and I absolutely love being a part of this congregation. We understand that the church is much bigger than just a Rundle Christian church, but we are excited to call this church our home. Um, you guys have shown our family love and have welcomed us in, and we um, don't want to be anywhere else. And so we just want to tell you guys that we love you guys. And uh, those of you that have reached out to our family and loved on our family, you guys will always have a special place in our heart. Um, I wanted to just fill you guys in on a little bit about what's happening in our family for the last eight months. Um, I work for a company in Jessup that sells wide format printers and the stuff that you print on. So like banners and that kind of stuff and using skills that God has given me. Um, through working here at ACC and different places to help sell those things. And so it's been uh, an interesting learning curve, but it's been a lot of fun, and it's cool to have somewhere to go every day. So um, also, I will be joining um, our Remix team in the fall. I'm super excited to be joining our, our Remix student team and uh, helping out upstairs on, on Sunday nights. And so if you've got a, a remixer, man, I'm excited to get to know them um, this fall, volunteering with that team. Also, I, I may be wearing a t-shirt today, but I want you to understand that I still do wear the pastoral uniform um, on a regular basis. I have lots of plaid in my closet still. <laughs> man, those of you that were around last July when we weren't allowed to wear plaid for a month, that was rough. That was rough. That was like half of my clothes that were gone, and so I had to get real creative, and it wasn't real fun. So, man, I'm excited. And Zachers, my little guy, he's wearing plaid today. I'm in solidarity, and uh, he is super handsome. Before we jump into the story of Esther this morning that we're going to be spending our time on, let's, let's take a minute and pray. Lord God, I am, I am so grateful for this, for this congregation. God, I am so grateful for the love that they have um, for each other, God, for this, this community that we're a part of. Lord, this morning we, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be in this place. Lord, fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit to hear from your word. Lord, use the words that I have. God, the preparation that I've put in um, leading up to this morning's message. God, to communicate clearly what you would have us to learn. So, Lord, speak through your, speak through your word this morning. God, we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we're in the middle of this series, Running with Giants. And, and the idea of this series is that there are giants of the faith that have come before. And we get to look at their stories. We get to look at the things that God has done through them. God has done in their lives to find encouragement. You know, it's this idea that it, what would they say to us? What would their encouragement be to us in our lives if they could come down out of the stands and run the race of our lives with us? You know, we've looked at two giants already. Two weeks ago, we looked at the story of Joseph. And the story of Joseph is one where his encouragement to us would be to don't quit. Don't quit when life doesn't go the way that we expect. And that's really going to build into what we're going to be talking about this morning in the story of Esther. But if you look at the story of Joseph, if Joseph were to come down, he would tell us not to quit when life doesn't go the way that we expect. 
Or we looked at the story of John the Baptist, the goat, if you remember, if you were here last week, the greatest of all time. You know, speaking of goats, I got to see one Friday night. I got to see Mike Trout hit a home run at Camden Yard. It was amazing. Um, and, and actually, a funny story with that. Chrissy and I went, and uh, we, we got there. We were, go- we were having dinner, and I told Chris, I said, look, we cannot miss the first inning. Mike Trout hits in the first inning. And we got there with just a little bit of time to spare. And, man, I, would, I don't know that I would have ever forgiven her if we didn't get to see Mike Trout hit a home run. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. I've seen it lots of times, and I look forward to seeing it lots of times. But as we look at this, as we look at these giants of faith, it's this idea, if, if, you're, if you follow sports, a lot of time coaches of teams are former players. You know, I think of some of the teams that I follow and some of the coaches that they have. You know, John Harbaugh is the head coach at the University of Michigan, and John Harbaugh was number four, played for an all-time great in Bo Schembechler at the University of Michigan, and he went on to have a a successful NFL career, was the coach of the San Francisco 49ers, and then now he's been the coach of the Michigan Wolverines. But he's a guy that played football, that knows the game. He's a guy that can lead well. Or I think of Mike Sosha, the coach of the Angels. I'm not sold on him right now. That's my own personal opinion. Um, But he was a catcher for the Dodgers, which again, like I'm not a big fan of that fact, but you know, I can set it aside. for my angels. You know, and, and, and in full disclosure, um, I'm a Laker fan when they're good. <laughs> Completely a fair weather Laker fan. So if they get LeBron, man, I told Chrissy the other day, like, if they get LeBron, I'm a Laker fan all in again. <laughs> Ready to go. So, but Phil Jackson was their coach for a long time, and Phil Jackson was a guy that was very successful with the Knicks. He was a player that was successful. So as we look at, at, at these giants of the faith, these are people that have lived their faith out, that they have lived the life that God has called them to live. So as we look at our races, now I don't know about you, I'm not built to be a runner. Like I was not built for distance, like short spurts and that's good. But as we look at this life, this life that we live with Christ is not a short race, it's a long race. And so these encouragements that we have from these giants of faith will help us keep going. The, the theme verse for, for this series is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and here's what it says. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race set before us. You know, this verse in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, is, is that building up point from Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 is what we call the hall of faith. And we see these people in Hebrews chapter 11 who were giants of the faith. These were men and women that lived out their faith in powerful ways. These were, were men and women that subdued kingdoms. They worked for righteousness. They, they held open the mouths of lions. They escaped the edge of the sword. And these were people who received their dead back to life. These were people that lived out their faith. You know, we read passages like that, and it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy for us to read their stories and think like, man, my life is super lame compared to some of these people. These people, they faced battles, and they they faced shipwreck, and all of the above. You fill in the blanks. You know, and my day consists of getting up and drinking coffee, and like changing diapers, and going to work, and drinking more coffee, and then coming home and hanging out with kids um, and putting them to bed and playing HQ on my phone and then falling asleep on the couch and waking up when Chrissy gets home from work. You know, that's like basically what my day looks like. And then I read the stories of these people from Hebrews chapter 11 and I'm like, well, that was a waste of a day. <laughs> See, here's the thing, and I don't want you to miss this. What makes those people extraordinary, what makes their lives worth looking at is that they were ordinary people who God used. And this is the same God, the everlasting God, who has worked from the beginning of creation, used ordinary people like us, people whose lives weren't extraordinary to accomplish amazing tasks so that he would get the glory. He wants to use every single one of us in exactly the same way. So maybe your life is ordinary, but God has a plan and a purpose. So as we dive into the story of Esther, as we look at what God is doing in the story of Esther, let's remember that Esther wasn't born into the royal lineage of Persia. Esther wasn't born to some noble family. No, Esther was an orphan, born into a nation of people that had been conquered. So when we see the stories of these giants, let's put them into context and let their context shout loudly to us to encourage us to keep going. 
So how do we run with giants? I think Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 tells us exactly how. It says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiate and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. So we do this by fixing our eyes on Jesus. That's what it means to run with giants, is to look towards the one, the author and finisher of our faith. So, so where does the story of Esther begin? Well, the story of Esther begins in conquest. The nation of Israel had been conquered. It was divided first, and then it was conquered by the Babylonians, by the Persians. It, it begins with, with a guy named Xerxes. Xerxes was the king of Persia. He was powerful. If you read through the story of Esther, his kingdom was expansive. It stretched all the way from India to modern-day modern Ethiopia and the Sudan. His kingdom was massive. And, and, and he started out with this banquet. And this banquet, he started out, these banquets were, were to plan their strategy for war, to go to war. And it was a seven-day banquet. And to say that they had a little bit of wine would be a massive understatement. It was a drunken festival. And at the end of these seven days, Xerxes gets it in his mind to show off how beautiful his wife Vashti is. Now, this wasn't just a, like a, a runway model where she was going to come in. This was most likely he was going to have her come forward and, and be completely new. And it was completely against the customs of the nation of Persia. He was going to degrade Queen Vashti, and she refused. Honestly, I don't blame her. She was, he was asking her to do something that was completely against the custom. And so one of the nobles in that, in that setting was like, look, you got to nip this in the bud, because if your wife is allowed to stand up to you, then all of our wives are going to stand up to us as well. So you need to nip this in the bud. And so, so Xerxes, he, he deposes Vashti. She, he kicks her out as queen. And so after that, this, this war that they'd been planning, they, they get beaten by the Greeks. And so in, in Esther chapter 2, Xerxes is there, and he's remembering Queen Vashti and remembering what happened. And, and there was no e-harmony. There was no Christian mingle. You know, there's no match.com for him to go find a new wife. So he does what makes the most sense to us as Americans. He creates the first bachelor, right? He has all these women come so that he can then decide which one he wants to marry. You know, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. So the bachelor really isn't new. It goes back to the story of Esther. <laughs> so in Esther chapter 2, Mordecai hears about this and, and enters Hadassah is her name. We're going to call her Esther because Hadassah is just an unfortunate name. So he enters her into this contest, and, and spoiler alert, Esther becomes the queen. Okay, I'm sorry if you haven't read the story. She becomes the queen of the nation of Persia, of the kingdom of Persia. And so Mordecai is her, her relative that had raised her. He, he's, um, Esther was her cousin, or was his cousin, excuse me. And so it, Esther becomes the queen. Well, as the story unfolds, Mordecai stays close to the kingdom. He sits at the gates of the palace, and he uncovers an assassination attempt. He hears that, that some knuckleheads are going to try to assassinate King Xerxes, and so he tells them, and they are able to thwart the plot. Well, you would think that somebody that stopped the king from being assassinated, everybody would know who he was. Well, that's not what happened. And so they wrote it down and, and took note of it, and that's about where it ended. You know, like, it's kind of disappointing, right? Well, so as the story goes on, we see this other guy in Esther chapter 3. His name is Haman. And Haman is an Agagite. Now, I know you all know who King Agag was, right? You guys remember who that was? Probably not. So I'm going to tell you. So King Agag was the king of the Amalekites. The Amalekites were the nation that Samuel told Saul, King Saul, okay, so we're going back a few years. Saul was told to wipe out the Amalekites, to not take any prisoners, to not take any spoils. So Samuel comes. And uh, asked Saul, what is that bleeding of sheep that I hear? Saul had taken animals as his plunder and had taken Agag as his, as his captive. And so here we are hundreds of years later, and Agag, the descendants of Agag, are then going to give the Israelites trouble. So Haman hates the Jews, finds out that Mordecai is a Jew, and so he sets out to wipe out the entire nation of Israel. Okay, so he sets out to wipe them all out because of what happened. So if, if Saul had just done what he was told, we wouldn't have this story. Does that sound like our, our lives as well, where we should have done, you know, like Chris and I have this saying, like hindsight is always twenty twenty. is that we, we always get in these situations where, 
man, I wish I would have done that. And, and here we have this, this time where if Saul would have just done as he was told. Do you guys have kids? How many of you, if your kids would just do what you told them, things would work out well? Can I get an amen for that? So here we have Saul. If he had just done what he was supposed to do, okay, we wouldn't have this situation happening. So this is the backstory. So this guy Haman wants to wipe out all the Jews, convinces Xerxes that he should do it. So this is, this is where the tension point comes in Esther. So if you've got your Bibles, open up to Esther chapter 4. If you don't have one, there's one in the seat in front of you. If you don't have one at home, take that one home. Seriously, we want you to have a Bible. We want you to have one that you can read. Write your name on it. We'll fill in that spot in just a minute. But Esther chapter 4 verse 13 says this. So Mordecai sent this reply. And remember, this is after a proclamation had been made that the Jews would be wiped out. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Do not think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all the other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Now here's the, the, the key verse here, the key part of the verse. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. So in this series, we've been talking about what the encouragement from the giants of faith would be. And here's what I believe Esther's encouragement for us would be, is that God has a purpose for your life. God has a purpose for your life. Every single person in this room, there's a purpose for which God created you. Some of you may know what it is. But what I've started to see is that a lot of us may not. A lot of us may not know what's going to happen next week, next month. Okay, but there is a purpose for which God has created us. He wants to use the circumstances of our life to build his kingdom. Do you think that Esther had any idea when she was growing up that she would become the queen of Persia? I'm guessing no. I'm guessing she had no clue. But God wants to use the circumstances of our life to make an eternal impact on the kingdom of God. That ultimately is our purpose. But most of us sit here and listen to a message like this and we think, yeah, but it's easy for us to, to look at the story of Esther and think, yeah, of course God used her, but he's not going to use me. We have excuses, right? We have excuses as to why God isn't going to use us. You know, I've done a lot of funerals. And in each of those funerals, people, I like to have people tell me stories about the people that I'm doing the funeral for. And there's always defining moments in people's lives. But my question for you is this, is what defines your legacy? What defines who you are as a person? Like I said, I'm sure that Esther had no clue that her life would turn out the way that it did. But we rarely realize that we're living through life's defining moments as they happen. You know, I think each of us can look back at our lives and look at the moments that have defined who we are. And none of us had any idea that in those moments, those would be the moments that would define who we are. But yet those are the times that we can look back and see that God is moving. So I've got four points to encourage you this morning to live with purpose. And here's number one. Let direction replace your hesitation. Let direction replace your your hesitation. If we go back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it's not going to be on the screen, but as we look at it, if we fix our eyes on Jesus, that's the direction in which we're running. It's the destination, is we are called as believers to run a life, to live a life running after Christ. When I was in high school, I played football, and, and I've told a lot of you about playing football, but my sophomore year of high school, we had a coach named Coach Charles, and Coach Charles wasn't actually a football coach. He was a track coach, and he came to our team as a conditioning coach to help us to learn how to get into shape, and one of the things that he taught us was that when we ran, when we were running our, our laps or running our sprints, to run with our heads up to see where we were going. And he taught us why it was important. And you know, when you're bent over, when you're tired, and you're just kind of huffing along, you, you take your eyes off of what the intentional, what the goal is. And how many times does that happen in our lives? Where we've taken our eyes off of Christ, and we're so caught up in the circumstances that we've missed out on the purpose for which God has called us. And so when we get tired, we lose sight of those things. 
But see, here's the thing, is those, those moments where we can make a difference, okay, we're called to step up and lead. Here's what Winston Churchill said about that. In every age, there comes a time when a leader must come forward to meet the needs of the hour. Therefore, there is no potential leader who does not have the opportunity to make a positive difference in society. That's true of every single one of our lives, is we all have an opportunity to be a leader, to be a leader in the places where we are. Do you think that Winston Churchill, when he set out in a career in politics, understood what, what the outcome of that career would be? Do you think that he set out to lead England through the fiercest war the 20th century knew? But yet he made decisions. He led in the opportunity that called. So it's my hope that through the story of Esther, you'll see that despite the current circumstances you're living in, that God wants to use you to make a difference. Maybe you're in a place where you can make an eternal impact with the people you work with. Maybe you're the only glimpse that people will have of Jesus. Maybe it's that boss that's riding you. Maybe it's that boss that, that, that won't leave you alone, that everything you do isn't right. Or maybe it's that boss that could care less what you're doing. You, maybe it's, it's that coworker who's great, who you love to death, but you know that they're perishing because they're living a life apart from Christ. You know, you have to fill in the circumstances, but you are in these places for a reason. So when we let purpose, when we, when we replace hesitation with direction, we can live out a life of purpose. You know, the end goal that we have in mind is eternity. John Maxwell said it this way, is that courage and initiative come when you understand your purpose. When you understand what God has called you to do, and that's to live a life that glorifies him, that supersedes everything else that we do in life, is that our life should be a glorification of Christ. And so the things that we do ought to glorify Christ. The things that we do ought to show who Christ is. And that's a constant process, isn't it? It's something that we're all striving for on a daily basis. And if we're honest, there are days that we're better at it than others. Am I right? Like there are days where I'm good at it. And there are days where I am a poor reflection, and it's embarrassing. But see, that, that's what defines all of our lives. But when we let purpose, when we let purpose drive who we are, listen to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5. He said, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You be careful how you walk Walk as wise, not as unwise. You know, and Paul wrote that 2,000 years ago, that the days are evil. The days that we live in are evil also. So we need to be a light in darkness. We need to be the light that God has called us to be. So when we live with purpose, though, there are still going to be times where God's purpose is not evident. So this is number two, is the plan might not always be obvious. The plan might not always be obvious. I'm not great at strategy games. So like Risk, if you play Risk, you're probably going to beat me. I don't always see the strategy of, of what's going to happen. But there will be seasons in life where we're living the purpose that God has called us and the plan won't be obvious. It's not always obvious what God is doing in our lives. You know, think of the story of Esther. In the midst of everything that is happening, Esther finds herself in a moment where the nation of Israel is still going to be destroyed, even though she sits on the throne as queen. You know, things look like they're on the up and up, but what happens when the ground becomes shaky? What happens when the ground that we're walking on becomes uneven? And you know, we grasp that God has a plan, but we just can't see what it is. That's what happens when we, when we take our eyes off of the one who authored our faith. You know, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, is that Jesus is the one that we need to keep our eyes on. So the idea of this series is that we can find encouragement from Scripture. We can find encouragement from men and women that came before us. We can find encouragement from the men and women that are sitting next to us in this room, that are sitting across from us in life group. The idea of this series, when we, when we get into that place where the plan isn't obvious, sometimes we have to step out in faith. You know, stepping out in faith is, is easier said than done. I grasp that. But Peter had to get out of the boat before he walked on water. The priest had to step into the Jordan River before the waters parted to carry across the Ark of the Covenant. 
whatever the circumstances we know, we're convinced that God is using them for his purpose. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose for them. But as we look at that, you know, a lot of people like to read that and think that everything is going to be rosy. Everything is going to work out. But is that the way life works for you? It's not the way life works for me. It's not the way life works for most people, is that there are consequences to our decision. There are things that happen in our life that are out of our control. You know, there are times where we don't see the plan, but Paul reminds us that God uses our circumstances for his purpose. He uses our circumstances for his glory. Listen to what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1. He says, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. Read the story of Paul and Acts. The story of Paul and Acts, we would have quit a long time ago, but yet Paul continued. He was whipped. He was stoned. He was thrown in prison. He was shipwrecked. All of those things happened, and yet Paul continued to follow Christ. Do you want me to think that Paul didn't have moments of doubt, where he didn't understand what the plan that God had for him? What about Joseph that we talked about two weeks ago? Don't you think that maybe he doubted the plan when he was sitting in prison after Potiphar's wife said that he tried to rape her? Don't you think that maybe Joseph doubted the plan when his brothers threw him in the well and, and were going to leave him to die, that they sold him into slavery? Don't you think that he doubted what God was going to do when his friend got out of jail and promised to remember him and it was years later? There are times in our life where circumstances are against us, but yet God has called us to step out in faith. And we can do that. This is number three, taking risks. Stepping out in faith is easier when we know that God is in control. It's easier for us to step out in faith when we know that God is in control. See, Joseph stepped out in faith because he knew the one that promised is faithful. And the one that promised to Joseph is still faithful today. So when our circumstances dictate that, you know what, it's time to give up, we can trust that God will continue to be faithful. So let's get back to the story at Esther. Esther chapter 4 verse 15 says this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together the Jews of Susa. Fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. So Esther took the opportunity and stepped out in faith. We'll get into the story in just a second. But look at Psalm 137, verse 8. Here's what the psalmist writes. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. So as we look at the story of Esther, as we look at the steadfast love, as we know that God is going to fulfill his purpose when we step out in faith. So Esther knew that her decision was a life or death decision. If she didn't make a choice, she was going to die. If she didn't step out in faith, she was going to die. But she also stepped out in faith knowing full well that if she didn't find favor with the king, she could die as well. Even though she was a queen, even though she was the queen of the entire kingdom, she could still be killed if the king didn't welcome her into his presence. So Esther goes to see the king, as she said, after three days of fasting. The king grants her an audience and says, look, I will give you whatever you want up to half of my kingdom. And Esther says, okay, I just want to have dinner with you and Haman. And so the king says, okay, we can do that. And so Esther invites the king and Haman to dinner. And, and she says, okay, I, I want you to come back tomorrow and I'll make my request known. Now, I don't know about you guys, but the way my brain works when somebody, specifically Christy, says, hey, we need to talk. My brain goes into overdrive, and I, I, I start to assess every conversation that we've had when she says that. So when, when the king says, well, what do you want? She says, I'm going to tell you tomorrow. Like, that reminds me of the times where Christy's like, hey, we need to talk when you get home. And most of the time, it's benign. Most of the time, it's, hey, what do you think about this? Or, or do you want to do that? But the way our brains work, right, is, is we start to think of, like, she asked me to do this. Did I do that? 
you know, did I remember to do that? Or did I say that I wasn't going to do something? Like, and I went to Starbucks four times last week. Like, you know, I, my brain begins to work in overdrive. Well, the same thing was happening to Xerxes. Is, is Xerxes that night is, is sitting up and he can't sleep. And so what he does is he asks some of his servants to come and read him some of the, the stories of, of things that have transpired in his kingdom. And he hears the story of Mordecai, the story where Mordecai thwarts the plot to assassinate him. And he asks his, his servants, like, well, what did we do to recognize Mordecai? And they're like, we wrote it down here and that's it. Remember, we talked about this a few minutes ago. And so he says, so he calls Haman. He says, Haman, look, we need to recognize somebody. You know, what would you do to recognize somebody that had done something amazing for the king? And so Haman is thinking, like, sweet, this is my chance for me to be recognized in the entire kingdom. Now, keep in mind that Haman had put in this plot to kill the Jews, right? And between dinner and when he had come to meet with the king, he and his wife had come up with this plan to build a giant pole in their backyard to impale Mordecai on. Okay, that's how much he hated Mordecai. He built a giant post to impale him on. Okay, and so the king says, well, what should we do? And, and Haman comes up with this brilliant plan to parade him through the city and to make his name known, thinking that it was about him. Well, the king says, okay, go do that for Mordecai and makes Haman do it for Mordecai. Okay, think of your mortal enemy. Okay, think of the person that you hate the most in this world and then think about having to go hang out with them and like tell everybody how great that person is. And that's what happened to Haman. Haman, oh man, he was ticked. And so that next night at dinner, this has happened. And so the king says, all right, Esther, tell me what you want. And she tells him, she lays out this whole plot that Haman has been plotting to kill the Jews and that she herself is a Jew. And that if Haman's plot goes into fruition, then she's going to be wiped out as well. And the king is rightfully furious. So the king sets about setting everything right. Okay, and this was all because Esther stepped out in faith. Okay, she used the circumstances of her life to affect change. See, if you read the, the rest of the story of Esther, Haman is impaled on the pole that he built in his backyard. Okay, he gets, him, you know, he gets his own, he gets his comeuppance, right? Okay, and so as we finish out the story of Esther, my last point is, is what the story of Esther is all about. Okay, is it that God, this is number four, is that when you realize God's purpose, live boldly. When you figure out what God's purpose is for your life, live boldly. See, Esther had to step out in faith. You know, God is present throughout the entire story of Esther. God uses Esther to save the kingdom. And God is present in your story too. God is present through the circumstances that you're enduring. He uses our circumstances to draw us to himself. And then once we come to him, he uses his circumstances for his glory. Romans 14 verse 8 says, if we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So that whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Each of us is called to live out the Great Commission. That's the ultimate purpose of our life, is we're called to go into all nations and make disciples. For some of us, that all nations is, is the job that we go to Monday through Friday. For some of us, that all nations is going on missions trips, like our, our teens are going to go on to Costa Rica, or like they, they were this week for the Jerusalem Project. For whatever it is, God has called you to go into all nations and make disciples. In just a second, we're going to sing a song that, that is one of my favorite songs. And in it, 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 it talks about the story of, of John the Baptist, really. It's, it's to make straight the paths of the Lord. Is, is we're singing because we're called to make straight the paths of the Lord. It's up to us to examine our circumstances and to, to, to look at them and see what God has called us to do. We have no excuse. We have no excuse but to live out the purpose, which is to make disciples. So if you're wondering what your purpose is, that's it. The rest of it doesn't matter. If you're not sharing your faith and you're not living out your purpose, if you're not living out what God has called you to be, then we're not living out our purpose. And unfortunately, far too many of us don't do that on a daily basis. So step out in faith. Let's pray. God, it's easy to stand up here and 
tell people that they should live out their purpose, God, to share their faith. So God, this morning we pray for courage. God, we pray for strength, that you would encourage us to know what it means to share our faith, to live it out. God, give us the faith of Esther, that whether we, we live or die, God, that our lives belong to you. God, remind us daily that our circumstances aren't the end. God, the, the, the things that are happening in our life aren't the end, but God, you want to use us in powerful ways. God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. God, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name.